people should just know that there are alternatives. That just because we do something one way doesn't mean it's the right way. It does work the way it is, but there's always new ways of doing things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I think ecological design, and when we start talking about sustainability and you know, resource shortages, water shortages, electric shortages, those sorts of things, and upcoming constraints that we don't necessarily have to feel, and this is somewhere that we have debate in, at the Gund Institute about, is that you don't have to feel that you have to be constrained and do a lot less. I think we can do a lot more with what we already have and we just don't do it. I work on something called ecological design, ecological engineering. I basically design artificial ecosystems and uh, treatment systems where I try to treat wastes. In particular, these wastes come from mining. So I'm trying to break down a bunch of the organic chemicals that are used to separate the minerals that we want industrially from the ones that we don't want. I'm from Thompson, Manitoba. Um, it's a small mining town in the northern parts of Canada. And I worked with INCO doing a whole bunch of work around environment and mining. So that's kind of what set me up with my interest in mining and I ended up studying that here. Right now I'm testing something called an eco machine and I'm running different types of mining waste through them to see if I can break down the chemicals that go into them. So this eco machine is basically um, multiple cells with different ecologies inside of each one. And the idea is that by linking these different ecologies together, you'll, you'll end up with a complete treatment of the chemicals that you're trying to get rid of. Sometimes you'll find the case that um, if you only use one type of ecology that you don't get complete treatment. So our, our, our idea is that if you link these together, you know, the first cell might break down part of the chemical but not completely, not to an ultimate stage. But if you link that to something else, it might eventually be broken down completely. Um, for us, a lot of it is what we're starting to call eco-mimicry. You hear uh, one of the big buzzwords nowadays is biomimicry. Well, for us, biomimicry is when you actually go after only a single trait. I'm interested in this particular trait because it does this particular thing. And we don't see that as providing the whole picture. It doesn't provide the whole treatment. It doesn't do the whole job. What we're introduced, interested in are the interconnections and the way that these different organisms and different systems support each other. If you don't find a, a big pond just full of microbes doing something by itself, that there's actually a shoreline next to it and there's plants that are growing there, there's runoff coming off the land, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to mimic that in our systems. And the idea is that the system will be more robust or that if something, say it gets a pulse of a really strong waste or something happens really quickly, that by having these, all these systems interconnected to each other, that it'll be able to absorb the shock and be a lot more resilient than a system that might become overwhelmed and die off. What is living technology? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, we're trying to fit something that nature does on its own into kind of a engineered or a system that benefits humans. So out in nature, it does these things on its own. Right now, we're trying to direct nature's ideas and nature's capabilities towards human ends. Um, but at the same time, not over-engineering it so that we're in control of every aspect of it. We're just trying to direct it to a goal that we have and we let it do it on its own however it does it. And then we try to understand how it's doing that. So there are different parts to it, but that's how I see eco-technologies. I guess I see it in two ways. There's the personal level and then there's the kind of global level. Um, if I start with the personal level, growing up in a town where there's mining, you're always impacted by the, the emissions, the gases that would come out from mining. And when I actually worked there and saw the impacts of uh, for every little pound of nickel that people want for different things, stainless steel, all kinds of uses we have, you know, even wind turbines, all the alternative technologies use a lot of these minerals. And you see the amount of waste that's also produced that there's no solution for yet. So that's kind of the personal driver that I grew up in a place that's impacted by these things. But at the same time, you see that it provides for the economic needs of the people there. And it generates a lot of revenue, so there's kind of a dichotomy. Um, on a global scale, if you kind of extrapolate that out and you start to see that there's mines all over the world, and there's historic mines that have been left behind. In the U.S., you'd call them Superfund sites. Um, they're all over the place, and they're impacting waters, impacting the biota, all sorts of things like that, human health, animal health, what, what not. So no one's really come up with any good solutions for that right now. Um, people are testing out all kinds of things, but it's almost like the oil spill. It's still a big experiment. We don't know everything that's going on don't even grasp all the chemistry yet. The basics, yes, but every place is nuanced. So I thought n there's very few people who are taking an ecological approach. Um, there's people who are doing constructed wetlands or very specific technologies. But um, 
we're kind of thinking, can you actually incorporate this into the process of mining as it's happening now, so that it's pre-treated before it actually goes out into the environment? We have to ask a fundamental question of how do we treat the minerals and the resources that we're actually extracting already? We're not necessarily recycling, we downcycle a lot of things, we throw a lot out. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but I think at the present time, the way that we're using our minerals, we're kind of stuck with a lot of this waste. So do I think I have a perfect solution? No. Is it something that's helping to address the problems that are there now? Yes. But I hope in the future that we'll shift away from even needing the sorts of things I work on to kind of rethinking the way that we use our minerals and, and different resources. Can we do something in an ecological system that has multiple outputs and multiple benefits? So not just a single output or a single benefit. You know, can we sequester carbon at the same time as treating a waste and maybe even produce a new product? So you start to have these interconnected systems that are doing multiple things at once, all for the same cost, instead of having separate things doing things with individual costs that aren't connected. So in our minds, we're still working on proving the economics of all this. But there's, there's different examples around the world, but we're trying to show that this is a more efficient way of doing things. It costs less money to do it this way. But the idea is to go to ultimate degradation, where it's turned into things like CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, gas, methane, etc., etc. And by breaking it down, phosphorus, sure, all the different things like that, by breaking it down into the, the, the constituents, then it's less toxic to the environment, less toxic to humans. And by having the plants and things in there, you can actually uptake some of the nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus, and prevent them from escaping into the, into the waterways. A problem that has come up in trying to adapt eco-technologies to a mineral is how do you keep the mineral suspended in the water. Um, it takes more energy to do that versus eco-machines that are towards treating agricultural runoff or those sorts of things because a lot of that waste is all organic and it can be biotransformed into other things, into plant mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you're dealing with a mining waste, you have minerals that aren't going to be transformed. It's basically powdered rock, so you have to recover that and at the end separate that out from the water. Sometimes people think that you're actually just supporting the industry, letting them get away with murder kind of thing, so that they get to go on with business as usual and we're the greenwashers at the end of the tailpipe. That comes back to my sentiment of, well, these wastes are being produced now regardless and we need to do something about it because it's impacting the environment and that. Do I think this is the solution that we're going to want and have down, you know, a hundred years from now? No. I think you redesign from the beginning and start to look why are you producing this mineral, how are you doing it this way, why are you extracting it this way, etc, etc, and how can you reuse it once it's already extracted. The other criticisms we have as well are, are your technologies nothing more than conventional technologies with plants stuck on top of them? So it's kind of like another idea to try to say, you're not doing anything differently than what the conventional technology is, you're just putting plants or those sorts of things on top. And how we try to rebut that is basically like, the plants and all these different organisms do so many jobs that are inside. There's tons and tons of literature that's out there showing all these different things that they do. It's actually as understanding as an ecology and how they're interacting with each other. That's where it becomes mind-boggling because the interactions are so huge. It's, it's almost impossible to understand. You could study that one little system for the rest of your life and not necessarily grasp everything that's going on. But when you start to test them versus conventional technologies and see that they're more resilient or robust, in the events of shocks or un unforeseen events, it kind of tells you that there's something going on there. And I am a bit of a technological optimist, but when I say technology, I'm thinking of nature's technology. Not necessarily that we're engineering, we can engineer our way out of everything. No, I don't think so. But I think if we start to do things the way that nature does them, that we'll, we could, there's so many gains that could be made, we can learn so much from it. We could do a lot more with a lot less. So just taking that thinking and applying it to our industries, taking that thinking and apply it to our engineering, approaches. I think there's a lot that can be done. So, and it's, it's important for people out there to learn about this. And it's important for me to learn about it. It's going to contribute to people's knowledge and bettering the way that we do things. So I'll keep at it.